dare to imagine, dare to believe in a true love that gave us a reason for living. Can you feel the hope that's rushing in? Can you hear the song that's echoing? Join with the choir as we sing. This is where love truly begins. Oh, God is with us. Thank you for joining us today here at the Foundry Church. As we get ready to go into the Word of God today, we know this, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, it's one of his titles, um, he is the hope of this world. He is the only sustaining hope this world has. And we know this, that the Word of God is the fullest and finest revelation of who Jesus Christ is, who God the Father is, and who the Holy Spirit is. And as we tune our hearts into the Word of God, God, we, we desire and we long that this word would form us and that this word of God would move into our hearts, take up residence and transform us. So would you join me in a moment of prayer as we tune ourselves to what God's saying and listen closely to how he is speaking into our lives. Lord Jesus Christ, today we, we are mindful of who you are. You're our savior and the Lord of all creation. And God, we know that you spoke this world into existence. And so we, we pray today that you would speak your word into our lives, that it would be fertile soil and that we who, um, God, we who struggle with who we are, our identities, um, our securities, um, our worthiness, God, that you would speak a word into us and we would receive it and it would bear um, life in us. There would be life because you've spoken a word into us. God, speak to your church, we pray. Guard our hearts and minds and may your spirit be moving in such a way as to reveal you and that we would hear that word spoken into our own hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, I don't know about you, but I love a fairy tale story. I think they're awesome, right? Uh, quite often you find someone who's on the outside, they're unloved, they're rejected, and they're a slave to their surroundings. And um, often the person posing, you know, usually there's like wicked stepmother kind of character in this, uh, in these stories, and they're not their, they're a wicked stepmother. And um, then magically, almost miraculously, Something happens, something happens to rescue this person. They're rescued out of their circumstances and they're put in a new family, in a new life. And they use this new existence that they have to actually help others. We're drawn to these stories. I don't know about you, I'm drawn to these stories. We long for the idea of rescue and new beginnings. How disappointing would it be if someone who was rescued, someone who was taken out of a place of rejection and being on the outside and unloved, how sad would it be if in that story they, those who were rescued left the castle and went back to their former life where they started? to the wicked stepmother, to the person or the thing that has them slaving away to someone who will never love or accept them. In the book of Galatians, it's a book in the New Testament um, and it's written to a, a church that Paul planted in, in a city called Galatia, so they're Galatians. In the book of Galatians, Paul is pleading with newly rescued believers not to abandon the truth, and not to return to a life that was enslaved to sin. I think it's the Matthew Henry commentary, it says it this way. 
The churches in Galatia were comprised of both Jews and Gentile converts. Paul's purpose in writing to these churches was to confirm them in their faith, especially concerning being justified, being made right before God by faith alone, and being made right and justified apart from, separate from, the works of the law of Moses. The book of Galatians was written by Paul because the churches in that area were facing the, uh, a theological crisis, a crisis that said, this is how God wants you to act. And what happened is there's these people called Judaizers. They're Jewish people who became Christians and they love the law of Moses. It's a historical thing for them and they love it. It's part of their birthright in many ways, but they become Christians, but they wanna take with them the law and have it, and have it with them in Christianity. And what Paul's doing is saying, no, absolutely not. Because these Judaizers wanted the new Christian converts who come from a Greco-Roman world to come in and um, follow the law of Moses and be a Christian. They wanted both and, and it doesn't work that way. Quite often what they would do is they would require circumcision to come in and be converted first to Judaism and then to Christianity. And when that heresy was being preached, Paul composed this epistle, this letter to the church to correct it and to emphasize their liberty in Christ, their liberty in Christ to counter the perversion of the gospel that the Judaizers had done. That's why Paul wrote this. So let's do this. Let's jump into the book of Galatians for a minute, spend some time there in Galatians 1, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 10, and really two words define um, what Paul's doing in this. He's going to defend grace. What is grace? Let's, let's understand that word real quick. Grace is the undeserved or unmerited favor of God. We do not deserve it, but it's the favor of God. So this is what Paul writes. I am astonished, he's writing to the Galatians, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace, the unmerited favor of Christ and are turning to a different gospel which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you, a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or God? Or of God, sorry, I said that wrong with the wrong tense. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. When our kids were little, we had a talk with them about strangers right? Strangers. And here's the, the, there's kind of this weird moment because you as a parent want to teach your children to be respectful and nice. And when someone says hi, not to hide behind your leg, but to be like, hello. And like, you don't have those normal manners, but then you also have to teach them that not everyone is friendly. Not everyone is safe. And strangers can often pose a danger. That's why we have the awesome term, stranger danger, right? We have that term because of what it presents. And the reality is this um, for us, that, that we had to teach our kids how to behave if a stranger tried to lure them or something. Erica was, um, as a little girl, was uh, telling me, she wasn't telling me as a little girl, when she was a little girl, she was telling me the story of how her mom would have her and her brother Josh practice stranger danger. And they would run across their living room screaming, who would incite such chaos? But she wanted them to know and feel free to run and scream from strangers. She didn't want them feeling compelled by someone else, an adult, to do something. If they're a stranger and they felt uncomfortable, run and get away. Kick, scream, and make noise about it. So they would do that. 
We want our children to be safe. We want to protect them. And we know there are people out there who are perverse in thought and deed, and they want to harm our kids. So we teach them when a stranger comes, there are some people, not all, but there are some people whose desire is to take from you and harm you, and you are free to run, kick, squeal, and scratch, and get away as quick as you can. This is what Paul is saying to the Galatians. They are new believers. They are young in their faith. And he's saying a stranger has come in and they have preached a gospel to you that is leading you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Run, scream, kick, scratch, do whatever you can to get away because they're trying to put you back into slavery. They want you to think you have to earn your salvation and that is heresy. There is no earning our salvation. If anyone teaches you that you have to do things to earn your salvation, you need to run. You need to get away from that. There is not a certain way to pray. There is not a certain way to, to like a certain set of rules to follow. There is grace received by having faith in Jesus Christ, believing in him and receiving him. Paul was trying to say, you will be, if you, if you go back to the law, you will be reminded over and over and over how you cannot achieve salvation because you will fail. You will return to being a slave to your sinful desires. And, and so that's why Paul says it that way. That's why Paul puts it out there, that if anyone teaches you that you have to do things to earn your salvation, get out. Run away like a little child in front of somebody who is a threat to them. Run, scream, and kick if you have to. They are grace killers. These people are grace killers, and they want to enslave you once again. Grace killers. I use that term. What does that mean? Someone who puts to death in you the belief that you have received the unmerited, undeserved favor of God in receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and they try to tell you a bunch of things you have to do. Great example of it, uh, Galatians chapter two, uh, two separate verses, verses 16 and verses 21. Let's read 16 first. Um, know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ, in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because the works of the law, by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Verse 21, I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. Hear this. This is why it's blasphemy to think you can earn your salvation or there's something you can do that um, will get you salvation. There is nothing other than receiving in faith Jesus Christ. If we could have been made right by God, by God with God by following a list of prescribed rules, by eating the right foods, not eating the wrong foods, saying the right words, kneeling the right amount of times in a service, then Jesus would have died for nothing. But that is not the case. They had the law, and they, they never followed. The Jewish people never could live in to the law. Jesus died for us to rescue us. We could not save ourselves. There was nothing we could do. By Jesus' death and by his resurrection, we are redeemed. We are brought into the family of God. Finally, we're put in a family where we're able to live the life that he created us to live. When we remember that we are created, we are created by God, then we also know this, that we were created with intentionality, and that intentionality gives you purpose. And when you live and you receive Jesus Christ, you're brought into the family of God, and you're able to live the life that he made you, he formed you to have and to do and to be. Quite often when we live outside this, we take the master craftsman's work, think of like a beautiful violin, and we play baseball with it. Yeah, it's a piece of wood, but it's not intended to hit a ball, 
right? It's, it's this misunderstanding. When we're brought into the family of God, we're used to the fullest and finest purposes of God's plan. Jesus died for us to rescue us because we couldn't save ourselves. But Jesus' death, by it, we are all redeemed. We are all offered, every person on this globe is offered redemption by faith because of the grace of God. That's what we are offered. We are brought into God's family if we receive it. It's why we preach the gospel. We want people to receive salvation. We want them to receive it and live the life he created us and them for. So we understand that long before the law was given to the Jewish people, God called a man. Before there was scripture as we know it, there was a man named Abram. And he lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. And he was out there and God called him. And there's something that happens in Genesis that points to the redemptive power of God and what God would do through faith. It says this in Genesis chapter 15, verse six, the first book of the Bible, 15 chapters in. Abram believed the Lord and the Lord credited to Abraham Abraham, his belief is righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This is important. It tells us this, that belief in action, faith in action, when we receive Jesus Christ, the act of receiving it is credited to you and I as righteousness. Galatians 3 uh, chapter three, verse 14, says this, the apostle Paul speaking. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham, the belief credited as righteousness, might come to the Gentiles, those beyond the Jewish faith, through Christ Jesus. So that by faith, we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Not only are you like that fairy tale rescued from your old life, and brought into this beautiful family. You're given a full new family, a people who believe in your worth, a people who believe your identity and the state you were born in is something God not only wants to redeem, but he wants to make use of because he perfectly made you according to his plan. We were welcomed into a new family, the family we had always wanted, a place where we are valued because of the value God gave us. It's always about the hand of the artist when we talk about this. And I don't know if I should go into the Salvador Mundi, but I'm going to. Um, but th there was a painting, it was bought for $1,100 in an old art shelf, dusty old rack, and they pull it down, they open it up and look in it, um, and they realize that it was the, the Salvador Mundi. Um, I think it was... I think it was Da Vinci's last painting. Um, it was one of his final paintings. And, and they find it $1,100, $1,100, which you're like, for a painting, hold your britches for a minute, because here's what happens. When they realize who had painted that painting and they had an artist go through and restore it, do you know how much it sold for? $400 million. Why? Because of who put their hands on it. It was a da Vinci. And because of the artist, the, the, the piece of canvas, worn and tired, had been undervalued by the world. But once they discovered whose hand was on it, they realized the inestimable, inestimable value of that piece of work. It went to $400 million for someone. Why? Because their value was who put their hand on them. And you were rescued because of who you, who made you. Jesus rescued you by his blood. But here's the important thing. You were given this new family and you were welcomed into the new family that you had always wanted. And here's the thing. You were always supposed to have it. Why? Because you're valuable. God wants you in his family. He wants you near. You are a prized possession. You're his handiwork. You are the great artist's handiwork. How beautiful is that? You may have come in here thinking or come today thinking you're worthless and Jesus Christ's life, death, and resurrection begs to differ. It fully disagrees with your assessment of yourself. Galatians chapter four, verses six and seven tells us this. Because you are his children, God sent the spirit of his son in the gospel of John. It would be called the paraclete, the spirit of Christ, um, into our hearts. The spirit who calls out Abba, 
father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you're his child, God has made you an heir, an heir to the promise. How wonderful is that? that you're part of the family of God. Why? Because you're his child. He formed you, he fashioned you, he values you. You, like that fairy tale, are a character who once lived outside with a wicked stepmother, Satan, who had enslaved you to your own desires and people pleasing and all these things, a slavery to selfishness, and you were rescued. You were brought out of it and welcomed as an heir into this new family. You're valuable and you're welcomed in. You have a new identity of someone who is loved and made right with God and full of purpose. Full of purpose. This is so important. We talked about it last week that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you so that you can live freely and be a blessing to the world that surrounds you. You can live with the traits of your heavenly father. Like the Salvador Mundi reflected the artist himself. They knew it was his work because of the lines and the shading. They understood it. When, when we look at our lives filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to have the traits of our heavenly father. In the book of Galatians, Paul calls these traits fruit. He calls it fruit. It grows naturally. This is the evidence of a life lived in freedom of Christ, in the freedom of Christ. Paul calls these fruits out, and I want to talk about it for a minute, but let's first name them, okay? Uh, Galatians uh, 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. There is no law. But be warned, this is not something you work at. You, you don't walk by an orchard and see an apple tree doing push-ups. That'd be weird. You gotta get those fruits, right? I'm trying to get those gains. That's not how it works. What do they do? They're rooted. They're rooted in something. They're placed in fertile soil and they just grow it because of what they're connected to. What they're connected to makes them fruitful. These fruits grow out of your life because of your belief in action. What you root your life in will produce fruit. So if your belief roots your life in the Lord Jesus Christ, how wonderful. It's based on what you believe. These fruits grow because of what we believe and how we, how we trust and believe in Jesus Christ. When you believe that you are valuable, when you believe that you are forgiven, when you believe that you are loved and free from slavery to sin and the other people's rules. And Christians nowadays are just as guilty of this. I heckle people all the time. I can help heckle my Baptist friends, my Reform friends, my Assemblies of God friends, the Vineyard, the non denomers who are far above any denomination, all those people. You know why I can heckle them? Because we all think we have a few extra rules that make us a little more salty than the rest. And it's a lie. It's a lie. The reason it's a lie is because faith in Jesus Christ, an active receiving of Jesus Christ, confirms in us the capacity to believe that we are forgiven, loved, and free from slavery to sin and other people. So therefore, our life begins to bubble over. It gets effervescent with this wonderful fruit that occurs naturally because of where we rooted ourselves based on our beliefs. Your beliefs define where you put your roots in. And based on where your roots are, fruit grows. Think about it. When I believe that God has wiped the slate clean, forgiven all my sin, how could I not be overflowing with joy? Like, I, let's not deal with your sin today. Let's deal with mine. I can't tell you how nice it is to know that I am free from the bondage and the burden of my past sin. And I don't have to live in fear that I'm gonna slip up and make a mistake. And when I do, I confess and repent of it because I don't wanna live in sin. 
It's so wonderful. It's so joyful. A life once dead is now alive, and there's joy in that. How would I not be patient with the people around me who maybe haven't received the same convictions I have? You can't do that. Why? Because I don't. Well, that's, that's my rule. The reality is this is, how can I not be patient? The fruit of patience grows in me, not for people to hurry up and get where I'm at, but to be walking in belief with the Lord and trusting him as he transforms them into his own image. And, and my prayer is that he's doing the same in my life. When you and I truly realize the depth to which we are loved, the amount of love given to us, how could we not love others? It doesn't seem crazy at that point to feel a calling to the mission field where you lose the luxuries of home to go obey the calling or a call into ministry or a call to be bold and possibly lose position in this culture and life because we stand on biblical truth. How can we not love people? How can we not have peace? Because we know that God is the one who's in control. God who said in Genesis 15, I'm gonna reckon Abram's belief as righteousness, and it was foreshadowing all these centuries and millennia forward that we would also be reckoned as righteousness by our belief in God. The God who holds all things in concert, the one who's in control, loves us. And because he loves us, he is faithful. The same is true for the other fruit, the other fruits of the Spirit. It goes on and on your life begins to bear fruit. If you're not producing fruits of the Spirit, the answer is not, not to try harder. That's legalism, right? I've gotta sing louder at church. I, I've gotta pray harder. I, I've gotta do, the, that. that's not it. The answer is to go back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Where do you believe? Where do you root your belief? If your belief is that in some way your salvation is dependent on you, you have an errant, a wrongly guided belief. Your belief goes back to the gospel. And I would say this, sit down with the Lord and quiet yourself. Sit down with him who made you. Invite the spirit of God to reveal to you how much you are loved in Christ so that you can respond in loving him back. Invite the Spirit of God to do that. Rest in it. Rest in it. One of the things we're terrible at, one of the things I'm terrible at is sitting in something, just sitting there and sitting in it. Once I feel like God's spoken something, I want to get going. I want to do things. <gasps> I know God loves me. I'm going to go show the world. Sometimes he's calling me just to sit in it. Just to sit in it. I have a memory of my youngest son, Ethan. This was back in 2014. He got a wicked fever. It was uh, the end of May. We were in a really tough season. He was so sick. Oh, the poor little guy. He was just, he was like a little charcoal briquette. And he was sitting in my arms and he fell asleep. He was about five. And you know as a parent, there comes an age where your kids don't fall asleep on you anymore. And it's super sad because I love that. And he fell asleep in my arms and I was sad that he was sick sick, but I was so glad I got to be there. And I got to be the place he fell asleep. Rest in the arms of Jesus. If your heart's sick today, confess your sins. Believe in Jesus Christ and lay down. Just relax in his arms. Be at peace and be loved right there. Don't squirm out of it. Remember, God created you. You're infinitely valuable because of who put their hands on you. You're infinitely valuable. Jesus died for you to pay the price for your sins. You have been set free from sin and the burden to please people. And trust me, every religious rule that comes your way is from someone else that is not from God. If you come from a legalistic past or you pride yourself on how you live by all the right rules, how you do everything just so to be righteous in God's eyes, you're not happy with this message. And I wanna tell you something. You're no more saved, you are no more saved than, than the person who's addicted to crack cocaine and just came to Jesus. They are as clean as, as you are in Christ. But I will tell you this, your works make you no better. Make you no better because their value and your value is the same in God's eyes. He made you both. 
And if you're a legalistic person who follows all the rules, dots all the I's, crosses all the T's, and says, amen, brother, at the right time, I wanna tell you something. That's not your righteousness. Jesus Christ, his shed blood, is all your righteousness. And when we understand that, it's, it's frustrating for those who dot I's and cross T's. And I will tell you this, you probably don't like the message. You're probably thinking, there he is, going soft on the gospel. He's preaching some watered down message. I wanna tell you something. I will stand on this till the day I die because I know this, all my good works are rooted in something broken in me. All my righteousness comes from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, and so does yours. We, we know this to be true. You may want me to yell at you, convict you of sin, say something, point out the sin you're dealing with. Here's the deal. No, I don't. I need to present the beautiful, winsome grace of God, the unmerited favor of God, that who you are is someone who's loved in God, and all God wants you to do is root your belief in him, not your behaviors, in him. Root yourself in him. Be with him. I need to preach the unmerited favor of God that comes as a gift from our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ. If you receive that gift and live the life, live, honestly, live a life in the love of God, his spirit is in you and it's yours. And here's where we deal with sin. The Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will encourage you. And yes, the Holy Spirit will convict you of your sin, but that's the Holy Spirit's job, not mine and not yours. You can look at me and see all the areas I need to mature in Christ, and I would probably have to say yes and amen, and I could do the same, but that's not my job. The Spirit of God must convict our hearts so that we respond in faith in Jesus Christ, that when the Spirit of God says that is a sin, and sin separates you from me, we don't wanna be separate by choice from that wonderful closeness of being rooted in Christ. So to stay in that, we respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not someone yelling at you from stage. Friends, take this word with you today. Your, valuable, your value is seen in who Jesus Christ is. And I invite you, root yourself, plant yourself in the Lord Jesus Christ. May he be all that you believe, all that you confess, and all that you hope in so that your life produces the fruits of the Spirit. And know this, that the Holy Spirit, who came as an advocate for us, will speak, will encourage, will guide, and convict you of sin. But that's the Spirit's job. That's the Holy Spirit's job, not ours. Pray with me. Lord, sometimes your word is hard for us to, to take and I pray for my brothers and sisters who are having a hard time today because maybe they've done all the right things but not believed. And I pray your grace over them right now, just grace. May they experience your love for them right now, not by what they do, but may they experience the joy of belief that quite simply you, you loved them while they were yet sinners. You formed them and you made them with a purpose. God, I pray that you would help us to receive such a rich and overwhelming gift and that you would help us live a life rooted in you. A life rooted, reading the word of God, not because we have to, but because it's the soil our roots are in. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and reveal yourself to your church as we are reminded that we are no longer a slave. We are no longer slaves. We are children of God, formed by his hand for his glory and his purpose. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.